uh, recording. Okay, we're going to be going over several different units tonight, and I am going to be skipping around. Uh, so if you're going or using your book, you may uh, get lost, but that's okay. We're still going to be covering, like I say, a lot of things in different spots in this particular book. Uh, properties of matter, and that, that's one of our first subjects. We, we, uh, we use a lot of different things in the refrigeration, air conditioning industry, but we have to have a basic understanding of matter. We have to have a basic understanding of the properties of a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Now, as we go through this, some of this is going to seem very, very, if you will, basic. I need to cover it anyway, okay? And that when I say very, very basic, let's, let's, let's take an example of the properties of a solid. A book, for example. How is gravity, gravity exerted on a book? It pulls it down, right? The force of gravity is only in one direction. Whereas a liquid, a liquid has forces that will pull it down and outward. Gravity is only pulling it down, but the liquid will take the shape of a container. Okay, a gas. How is a gas, where, where are the forces at on a gas? Everywhere. Yeah, all directions. Think of a balloon. It's pushing on all the surfaces of a balloon. Now, I know that, like I say, that sounds very basic, but we need to have an understanding of that to be able to understand how refrigeration works. Now, some of the things that you need to go over, I'm not going to go into any, any real detail with them, but weight and mass, uh, volume, standard conditions, uh, specific volume, density, it can get pretty complicated. And... You don't really need to get that deep into it, but you need to have a basic understanding. Y'all know what that is that we're talking about? This is a scary word. Physics. The natural science, if you will. Things that we're going to focus on is boiling and condensing points, freezing points, things such as that. But you still need to have a basic understanding of that. Now, in this industry, we do have to understand types of energy and some of their properties. Now you have potential and kinetic energy and we'll talk very briefly on that, like I said. Uh, chemical energy, thermal energy, I'm going to, uh, radiant energy, and energy, electrical energy, magnetic energy, and let's talk a little bit about the sources of some of those energies. Well, in our field, we break things up into two basic sources. We break it up into either electrical or fossil. Now, usually someone will come up and say, hey, wait now, isn't electricity made with a lot of fossil energy? Yes, it is. But looking at it in the field, our heaters are either going to be purely electric or they're going to be gas operated or fuel operated, if you will. So we're looking at those two basic things. Now, not to say that that's the only type of energies that we will see in the field because there is a lot of emphasis put over other type of energies such as radiant energy from the sun to solar powered things nowadays. Some of the alternate energies that are coming into play. We're seeing more and more of the other sources being used, which is definitely a good thing because fossil fuels are very limited on uh, their availability, especially in the future years. Now, there are some terms that we're going to have to know and uh, some of those will be BTUs, latent heat, specific heat, sensible heat, absolute zero, PSI, PSIA. Boy, I'm covering a lot of stuff in a hurry, but I'm going to go back and, and, and put a little bit of emphasis on each one. Watts, kilowatts, um, on the electrical side of things. Here in the United States we still haven't adopted the SI units even though the SI units are very common throughout the rest of the world we're still using the standard units. Now what do I mean by that? Well, good example, Fahrenheit and centigrade. We still use pretty much Fahrenheit everywhere that we're around. 
centigrade is more uh, in the scientific area of, of this nation, but uh, you will find that centigrade would be used worldwide, not just in America. Whereas Fahrenheit is probably more common in America than it is any other place. But we want, like I say, I don't want to get off on that too much. I want to get on into some of the basics of the uh, HVACR uh, field. Now, heat is something that you're going to have to understand and how it moves. What is heat? If you had to give a definition of heat, what would it be? How about the absence of heat is cold? In other words, we can't say something is cold. We can only determine how much heat something has. Everything has heat unless it is at absolute zero. Absolute zero, if we were using some different scales, scientific scales, if we were using the uh, ranking scale, for example, it would be 400, or, or in centigrade, I'm mean, excuse me, I'll get it right here, in Fahrenheit, it would be minus 460 degrees. There are some absolute scales that go with the centigrade and Fahrenheit scales one is called Rankin, and the other one is called Kelvin. Kelvin, I believe, would be uh, minus 273 degrees if it was uh, converted back to the um, centigrade scale. Absolute zero. That's when all the molecular motion stops. Have we ever hit that temperature? No, but we've come awful close. Liquid helium, when it boils, is it at approximately two degrees absolute? That's in uh, ranking. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not ranking. It's uh, Kevin. Two, two degrees Kevin. Um, that's pretty dang cold. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it. That's pretty dang cold. But you got to remember, we're going to be moving heat. We're not making cold. We're simply moving the heat away from an object or to another place. Okay, we definitely need to know how to measure temperature. There are several ways to measure temperature. We can either do it with uh, some of the instruments that we have today, would be such as a infrared um, instrument that would actually pick up the infrared that's, that's being transmitted off of the substance. Another is we can actually use uh, thermocouples and don't forget the old glass uh, thermometer. A glass thermometer still can be used. Of course you know what happens with a glass thermometer if it gets dropped. It's very, very sensitive, but it is still a vital part of temperature measurement. Now, I want to move a little further and talk about the way that heat moves. Heat moves in three different methods. It moves by conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay, conduction is pretty easy to understand because that's when the heat moves from molecule to molecule through the, through the material. If I had a copper pipe and I asked you to hold that copper pipe and I put a torch on the other end of the copper pipe, eventually you're going to let that copper pipe go. Because even though I'm only heating that other side, the heat will travel through it to the point that where your holding is going to get warm. That's, that is through conduction. Convection is a little bit harder to understand because convection is where you have the heat moved by another substance, transferring the heat from one substance to another. Good example of that, if I had a heater on this side of the room, and it wasn't a radiant heater, just a regular heater. Well, it would heat up the air. The air would circulate through the room and be able to heat objects on the other side of the room through the transfer of heat from it, that is the air, to the other object. So that is a form of convection. Most of our units that we see with fans in them, like the one in here, that is a form of a convection type for, uh, furnace or air conditioner. Radiation. Radiation is pretty easy to understand. If you're standing in the sunlight, you know that you're going to get warmer than if you're standing in the shade. 
Pretty simple. It moves through the waves, if you will, through of radiation. Um, one thing to keep in mind, when, when dealing with radiation, it's not just sunlight. You can actually have radiation, heat radiation from an object, whether it's uh, glowing or not. A lot of times people think of something glowing. And it doesn't have to glow. But you can actually have heat radiated from a wall, a warm window, or, or a, a uh, light. Light's a good example of radiation. These lights are actually giving off heat right now. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about something that you've been around probably all your life but probably never put that much emphasis on, and that's pressure. Now, we're actually living at the bottom of an atmosphere that has weight. The weight at sea level of the air above us is approximately 14.7 pounds. Okay. Think of a fish at the bottom of the ocean or near the bottom of the ocean. That fish is going to have the pressure of the ocean around it. But it doesn't crush the fish, just like the atmosphere doesn't crush us. The reason being, it is our environment. We're, we are living at the bottom of a sea of air. Any, any way you look at it, we got to have it, but it is a pressure. If we were to take a pressure gauge and take it to the outskirts of the atmosphere, and I'm going to help you right, at, right back in there. If we were to take it to the outskirts of the atmosphere, in other words, here's good old Earth, and there's my atmosphere, and I were to take a gauge out here in space, and I was to set it at zero, and I moved that gauge back in to sea level, it would read approximately 14.7 uh, pounds of pressure. That is the weight of that column of air above it. Okay, if you're up on a mountain, it's not going to have that much pressure because you don't have that much or as much air above it. Now, Something to keep in mind, when you see PSI, we drop the G, PSI G, PSI A. Absolute is when you take in that atmospheric pressure also. Gauge is when you have calibrated your instrument for the uh, zero when it has actual pressure already on it. Okay, most of our measurements are going to be taken in PSI G, but we drop the G and just call it PSI. That's pounds per square inch. Now, if I were to look at the way that's actually done, if this were one inch by one inch, and I put one pound of pressure on this, that would be equivalent to one pound per square inch. Okay? If I had a square foot, what would the actual weight be if it was exerting one pound of pressure on that square foot? The actual weight. Do you know? The square one inch. Six, one one six, if, I, if this was a square foot, and it's one pound of pressure one per, pound square inch, per square inch, it would be 12 pounds. Okay? It would be 12, 12. Yeah, 12. inches by 12 inches, which 12 by 12 is 144, you would actually have 144 pounds of pressure. Yes, Not pressure, but 144 pounds exerted on that square foot. Okay, keep that in mind. Have you ever thought about how in the world an automobile that has 30 pounds of pressure in it holds up a car that may weigh 1,500 pounds? If you look at the surface of the tire, that gives you a better understanding how it works. So when you see one pound of pressure, we don't usually think about it being a whole lot of, uh, of energy, or a whole lot of weight, or anything of that nature. But believe you me, if it's all released at one time, it is. And you would see that. Okay. So when we're dealing with pressures, keep in mind that even though the number may not seem high, there is a lot of energy that may be there. All right. Now, this is a little bit.